Welcome everyone to this evening's panel discussion here at the National Gallery of the Cayman Islands. This panel is entitled The Making of the Cayman Islands Biennial and we're here to discuss the third Cayman Islands Biennial which is entitled Conversations with the Past in the Present Tense. And joining me this evening are our three panelists. We have Natalie Urquhart, the Director and Chief Curator of the National Gallery. We have Leonard Dilbert, who is a authority on Caymanian art and culture, a writer as well, and fellow creative. And we're also joined by Davin Evans, our third member of the panel this evening. Davin is a practicing artist himself and also a professor of fine art teaching at Ohio State University. So welcome everybody. We're very excited to be here. As we're talking about biennials and this biennial, the Cayman Islands Biennial, um, I think we want to keep in mind what a biennial is. Not everyone is familiar with this art world terminology. Um, so I'll just sort of preface our, our remarks this evening and our conversation um, thinking about this idea of what a biennial is and the biennial model as a very particular genre or format of exhibition making. Now there are biennials all around the world, uh, probably the most, certainly the most historical and best known is the Venice Biennale, which was founded in 1895. But closer to home, we have some uh, biennials in the Caribbean and Latin American region that have really attained uh, quite significant stature. And I'm thinking about the Havana Biennial, which was founded in 1984, and also uh, the Sao Paulo Biennial, uh, and some of our peer organizations here in the Caribbean. We have uh, the Jamaica Biennial. Uh, we also have the uh, Bermuda Biennial. So Natalie, let's start by talking about um, the journey that this biennial, the Cayman Islands Biennial, has taken over the past four years. So can you perhaps begin by talking about um, what prompted you, what catalyzed the founding the Cayman Islands Biennial here and that journey that's taken us from 2019 to where we are now. Absolutely, thank you for sharing the introduction as well with some other models, so putting this into context and of course it was looking at many of those other models and the sort of history of um, biennials and what biennials try and do as exhibition projects. Um, you know obviously we're, we're an art museum, this is an institution, it's quite a, a classical museum space but we're always thinking I think at the National Gallery of the Cayman Islands so how to un, sort of deconstruct that museum institution space and that's obviously very much at the heart of a lot of modern museology thinking about how we can open the doors invite people in but also get out like out there into the community community engagement has been a major um, sort of a core part of um, the essence of this art museum and it's sort of almost 25 year journey um, so the biennial model was a really interesting one where we were looking at ways of getting art out into the community um, obviously, the, some of the other biennials you reference, Havana is a biennial in its truest sense because it usually means a country or a city inviting um, national representations from artists around the globe. So biennials by their very nature are usually multicultural, multinational, and this of course right now is a national project. Very much so in looking at places like Bermuda. Um, the National Gallery of Jamaica evolved out of their national exhibition and actually has almost returned to the national exhibition because of course these conversations about representing work from artists overseas in your space can be quite controversial in, in small countries that are building up their own sort of artistic identity. Um, but we always envision this having the potential to increase dialogue with the region. And I think maybe the longer term vision is to ensure as we build up our contemporary art scene through these kind of models that we have access to uh, potentially collaborating with other biennials certainly around the, the Caribbean first and foremost but potentially traveling some of our work to international biennials as well. Um, the biennial model again by its very uh, framework is a very responsive model. We think about some of those those venues and those, those structures that you referenced. Um, you know, normally the themes of a biennial are responding to um, various contemporary uh, challenges within one community or another, or global challenges in terms of something like Venice. 
Um, so there are very exciting platforms, I think, through which to um, set up a series of questions and to challenge our artist community to, to be responsive and to make work um, or recycle work or bring out, out, out of the, uh, not quite the closet, mm -hmm. um, in terms of people, we really encourage people to create new work for this project, but it is often a survey. Um, and I think it's been incredibly exciting. It's, it's, it deconstructs, as I said, this classic museum space even from day one, our very first year, we'd envisioned this and we were able to execute a multi-island, um, uh, multi-site um, project for the Biennale or Biennial. Um, I think we started off with six venues in the first year. Um, that grew again in the second year. And then of course this year, I think we have nine. I keep losing count because we keep adding venues uh, for the programme. And of course, the biennial program has been a, a sort of integral to what we're trying to achieve with this project as the exhibition space and the artwork in the exhibitions are. It's about prompting dialogue around whichever sort of themes we are addressing in that year. And I think that has had a real impact already in terms of people making work and the conversations we're building around that. Mm -hmm. And thinking about impact, I think now in 2023, we have the perspective of hindsight. We can look back now over three editions of the biennial. Um, so I wanted to ask Leonard, perhaps, wearing one of his professional hats, but as a, a cultural policy maker, as a, a cultural thinker, um, could you share your thoughts about um, how you see this biennial has already made a positive impact on the local art scene here, and how you see the cultural landscape evolving through projects such as the biennial and perhaps um, blind spots or areas in need of addressing if we really want to grow the art scene here and using a vehicle such as the biennial to do so? I think it's fair to say that the, the biennial in Cayman has been a catalyst for art production. The gallery itself as an institution has facilitated that as well, I think. Just the presence of a gallery, having a space that can show work and that encourages people to bring work to be shown. And in a sense, basically challenging artists to produce work that can pass a jury and get shown. And the Biennial as a specific opportunity to do that because partly, I suppose, the, there's a sort of prize-giving element, and that is always a, a sort of facilitator for public interest. But artists being peculiar types of people, uh, I think it goes beyond that to more of a, a challenge to, in a specific way, respond to the theme of the, of the movement, but also to, to meet the challenge of, well, can I show my best work and will that best work qualify to be shown in this exhibition? Given the nature of the exhibition, given that it is perceived, I believe, as a sort of best of Kimana at this moment in time sort of thing. And notwithstanding that, the, there's always the challenge of how do you go beyond the standard of work that you're accustomed to, produ to producing, what is it that will help to take you from that point to make a jump into something that is more profound, uh, more impactful? And for that purpose, the sort of international sort of exposure, I think, would be uh, a welcome development in some ways. but. There are challenges to that, uh, one of them being resource challenges. And those resources, not just from the point of view of the, of the management of the exercise, but the kinds of resources that would how to go into it to feel confident that you are comfortable in that space, in that international space, that, that you're not sort of setting yourself up to fail or to feel as if you fail because what we're producing can't hold its own against what is coming in from elsewhere and so on. And that brings me around to the question of what the other resources might be that would be valuable in the present context. And there are many. I, I think we, 
would be fooling ourselves if we, if we thought that we were in a, a sort of leading position in the art world, uh, viewed from an international perspective. But those resources are, are tricky to manage in that you can't, <laughs> you can't sort of produce art by simply uh, feeding certain resources in and expecting that that will produce mm. a specific kind of um, output. Art is not a commodity and the commodification of art is one of the one of the sort of um, dangerous thrills, if you will, that can suck people in because you can feel as if if you encourage a lot of artists to produce and they're producing a lot of work and that work is finding a market that you're actually getting where you want to be. And I'm not sure that that is a good measure of where you want to be. I agree. And I think, um, you know, shying away from language like cultural capital or mm. cultural economies is something um, worth bearing in mind. And I think some of the points you've just made about the biennial, I think bigger picture, and Davin will be able to speak to this uh, in a moment, I think. Um, but an exhibition is a temporary platform, right? That mm. lasts for three or four months. And so I think some of the work that the National Gallery has been doing through projects such as this is about longevity and legacy building and providing a platform not just in the space where we sit and through the exhibition itself, but through other channels such as the publication of the catalogue, and we can get into that later on. Um, but both you and Davin have served now as jurors and also on the other side of the fence as creative practitioners, as featured artists in the biennial. And Davin, I think uh, you have a unique perspective because you're also a teaching artist, a professor. So, um, perhaps you can share a little bit, and uh, Leonard, do chime in on this as well, about the jury process, because as people will know, this was an open call exhibition featuring 57 artists, but we had 136 artists apply, and the task fell to you and Leonard, and Natalie contributed, as well as Lisa Howie, who's not here with us today, but Lisa Howie, uh, prominent um, curator and, and gallerist from Bermuda. So the three of you were sort of put in this unenviable position. So Davin, can you speak a little bit about the process and what it was like being a jurist for this project? Yeah. Um, I've, I've done quite a bit of juring and this, uh, this falls under sort of like standard operational procedure for juring, which is where the jurors have to come to some sort of consensus. Um, that's not always the case. I've, I've I just juried uh, uh, a publication for glass work where basically there's a set number of spaces to fill, maybe 2,000 artworks um, that you're looking at, and you have 100 spaces, and there's four juries, uh, jurors, so you pick 25 things, and there is no need for consensus, which is really interesting. In this particular case, because there's that prize element, um, that changes things. So the other kinds of shows that I've uh, been a part of during or curating, that maybe not be part of it. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to come to that sort of consensus on um, on who you know sort of who wins that prize. That 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 changes things a little bit because you you want to have that that generalized consensus. Um, you know, the process was you know, pretty, pretty long, three days, I think, virtually, that we worked. I could be wrong with that, but I think it feels like three days, virtually, that we worked to narrow down. Um, and and this, this biennial um, is also unique from other things that I've uh, been a part of during in the fact that there are um, proposals for projects that then the gallery helps to um, support to manifest those projects, which I think is fantastic. But that also creates a very unique challenge for the jurors because um, we might not know who those artists are, we might not know their past work, we might not know if they can pull that off in the you know, months that they have or whatever. <laughs> um, 
so that that's also a thing that that became a conversation is like are we looking at the finished thing or is this a proposal and, and where does that go um so there's sort of three days of those discussions. We kind of narrowed down the pool to what we think can work, you know, of course, with, the, with conversation with the curatorial team because the curatorial team uh, has more, uh, like yourself, has more knowledge about the, the, the artists and what they've done recently. And, and after that, then there is you know, the return from the, those people who made proposals that we said, yes, that sounds like a good proposal. Can you go off and make it? And then they come back and they show us what they've made and we look at those and go, yes, or we have some feedback. That, that particular part is a unique thing because that's, um, in my experience so far, unusual to have curators, not curators, that's not true, jurors give feedback to artists to help move the work in a particular direction. Cur curators, yes. Absolutely, is what is one of the things that curators do. And can I speak to that? <laughs> yeah, please. It's a really interesting element, and as you said earlier on, the facilitation and the support to realise some of those subjects, these projects. We, you know, even in the very first year, I think that there was a philosophy that this was a developmental opportunity, right? And I think that has really, rather than just being a showcase of the best work that we can find through the jury process, some of the projects that we're really hoping people realise are outside of their own comfort zone. They're pr producing um, installation works where they might be painters. Someone like Randy Chalette has really, um, really skyrocketed, I think, in terms of his um, evolving practice that started off with the first biennial um, in terms of the installation work. So just one example, but I think the proposal element is because there's often quite an expense involved in those. So a lot of our artists maybe aren't comfortable yet doing that work without some feedback, but also maybe aren't ready to invest unless they know that they're a bit further down the process. So we've gone back and forth about that a little bit because I think we are an education institution at our heart here. And if we can help people stretch their own practice, both before, during, and then after, or onto the next biennial, I think that's a re really important point of impact for us in one of the aims of the project. Mm. Um, but it doesn't add an extra layer or two, which lengthens the review jury process, mm. as you said, and requires more input mm. um, from you guys, which we were very grateful for. And, and that's, that's where I was going with that, was yeah. with that, that, that part of that is a thing that helps nurture, because it, as, as an artist, if you may, say my practice is making objects, but I want to expand into something that's more in, installation or time-based or you know, social practice or something. How, that might require expense. Where do I put it? Where do I store it? How do I, how do I even set it up without a space? And so uh, I, I think it's actually a really interesting and a really valuable part, especially considering the sort of the remit of the National Gallery has sort of always been that kind of nurturing element for the local arts and the kind of nascent art scene. Yeah, a couple of things. They the word development has been used and in this specific context I think we need to also use the word pedagogy because mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a specific pedagogical element in terms of the teaching process and it is one of the resources I was talking about that if, you, if you're looking to, to stimulate growth among artists in a, in a relatively uh, inexperienced artistic forum. You, you're going to have to inject a certain amount of pedagogy, a certain amount of attention to pedagogy, and, and along the way, hopefully get some sort of measure in doing that of what it is you're working with, and from what it is you're working with, you begin to understand what other sorts of resources might be necessary. That, those sorts of investments that, that people may be shy to make, you get an idea what sorts of investments would be necessary, or might become uh, a draw for people. So I think it's useful to bring those terms into the language as well. Absolutely. And there's an element of risk, I think, involved in an open call exhibition. Mm. But I think that sort of democratic spirit, really, of really offering a platform for artists to participate. And what we're always encouraged to see is um, the new faces, mm. you know, artists who have not exhibited at the National Gallery before and exhibiting in what is, you know, effectively the preeminent 
exhibition platform that we have here. Um, and I think the other thing that we should speak to as well with this exhibition is uh, you talked about juggling these different considerations as a juror. Well, of course, um, the third wheel or the other element involved in a thematic exhibition such as this one is the theme. Because from a curatorial perspective, the team at the National Gallery are not only thinking about you know, the qualitative merits of one work versus another, which was what you were tasked with, um, but also how those works fit together. So I thought, why don't we start by unpacking a little bit this theme? So this year's biennial is organized under the title Conversations with the Past in the Present Tense. So it's a suggestive title, it's a starting point for exploring um, the vast terrain of Caymanian cultural history and memory and so forth. Um, so why don't we start, Natalie, do you want to give a bit of background as to how this topic for this year's biennial emerge and what, what it's about, what's it all about? Definitely, and I think there's been a debate over the years, hasn't there, whether we do have a theme or whether it's a, an open call, and I think we've been very conscious in that evolution. Yeah. The first year there was a very loose theme, we didn't actually put a theme on the first open call, but a natural theme evolved or emerged through it, looking at sort of evolving identities again. Um, but it makes for a much stronger and I think more impactful biennial project if there is this loose, and it is a loose and overarching theme. It's trying not to be too rigid so that people can, um, you know, by offering those sub-themes very clearly in the open call, it's trying to be a suggestive journey that people are responding to rather than a really um, conscriptive type of approach where we're only looking for X, Y, and Z. And I think that's worked very well. You know, there's a very wide scope in that interpretation. But I think conversations with the past and the present tense, it's, um, you know, we've all been in our various conversations, either formally, professionally, informally, within our communities, looking at this dramatic and rapid evolution in Cayman and the sort of Cayman of today versus the Cayman of even 50, 60 years ago. And that transformation being an island of 10,000 people in 1970 to an island of 75,000, which in you know, context is not that big, but is overwhelmingly challenging in terms of navigating the shift from past to present to future. So, you know, as a curatorial team, we were looking at this as a very urgent conversation um, of our times is how can we preserve but not get trapped in the preservation while still encouraging development and embracing this um, evolving Cayman which is multicultural, has influences from all over the world but without losing the core of that identity which is a place that we're very much at risk of being um, and that deep lament and that deep concern and nostalgia for what has been lost I think is very much very present in, in most of the conversations that we're having. So it was about this concept of evolving identities, about a, a identity always being in a state of development and flux, not being rigidly set, um, but always influenced by our past experiences. Um, so the title obviously was a bit of a play on that, um, but how are we being continually influenced as Caymanians, whether someone like myself who was born here but is not a generational Caymanian, someone like Leonard whose family go back generations and Davins, um, to someone that maybe has made Cayman their home a year ago. How are we being influenced by that history which is not necessarily as apparent or tangible in a country like Cayman without all of its big buildings and its hundreds of years of built heritage, um, how are we retaining a connection to that conversation and having it continue to influence who we are? Or are we moving ourselves so far away that we've lost the connection? Um, and I think this is one of the most urgent conversations of our time um, in our own country, but also globally. Everyone has, is experiencing globalisation in every country in the world. So it's not unique to Cayman, but we're such a small place with a very finite number of people. It's maybe more apparent. Um, and I think this was something that we wanted to put out there for people to grapple with, both in terms of exploring the cultural mythologies concept. Um, we love the idea of how without written history uh, and recorded history, our storytelling can become that history so that, that sort of the, the myths that we tell each other and the evolution of those myths 
can mean that we're now teaching in the schools something that didn't necessarily happen, you know, and that is something that we know exists. Um, how can we be sure that the histories that we're holding on to are the actual um, experiences that people had? So cultural mythologies was one, sites of memory, this idea of physically mapping and archiving, um, how artists are using um, the research component in their work. Um, it's also translated sites of memory into physical interpretations of what the physical landscape holds and the footprint of history on that physical landscape. Um, and then the third one has completely slipped. Identity. <laughs> identity. The biggest theme Cultural of all. identity. Identity. Yeah. Is and that's really our pop. There's a lot of energy and urgency in that particular space that has been curated. And of course, we've been very selective in how these groupings have been made as a curatorial team. Um, but I think together, there's a very powerful conversation emerging out of those uh, different works. Yeah. And we've, we've touched on it, or mentioned a few of the individual projects, but I thought we could hear from our jurors about some of the standout works and not really um, you know, name dropping or picking out individual artists so much as thinking about this idea in relation to the question of theme. Mm. I think some of the most successful projects, um, we had the two award winners that you talked about those well, that engaged before, before you, the theme. Before you um, mm. develop that. To say on that. Yeah, 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 yeah. before you develop that too far. No, just the question, of, the question of theme and theme yeah. setting and the content of the theme and, and all right. this. I mean, I, I think it's a, a valuable addition to, and perhaps even uh, a stimulus to the kind of conversation that needs to take place around those kinds of questions to articulate these kinds of themes, to add a language. I mean, I'm, I'm primarily a language artist and I'm very interested in the actual words that are used to try to formulate these ideas and, and try to place a challenge before the artist say, well, think about these questions and think about what these questions might mean to you and how you might respond to that artistically. And I think there, there's a specific value to that in terms of the contribution to the conversation itself, particularly given that there's a very real danger in the world that we live in right now, that nationalism can be used, as, uh, can be weaponized basically, mm -hmm. and, and can be used to exclude and to create all kinds of bases for even violent behavior between groups of people, uh, justified on that basis, that we can exclude this group for this reason because they are not us, the whole kind of us and them situation. Right? So it's a valuable kind of exercise, I think, yeah. Daphne, thoughts? <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I think the theme is very useful and very helpful to help prompt artists. Um, I think, frankly, the theme needs to be advertised almost immediately after the, the like if we have a biennial now, when we give the award, we advertise the next year's theme, the next biennial's theme. I don't know that that sounds probably insane, or maybe you've thought of it already, I don't know. Uh, but I, I think that if you want to push those artists to give them enough time mm. to, that, to really come to grips with that or to, to, to uh, maybe take on a project that they wouldn't have, I think it, there needs to be that kind, because um, I, I, and maybe this is just speaking like, you know, too much information about my own personal practice, but it takes me a long time mm. to sort of absorb and assimilate something mm -hmm. and then to somehow or another, uh, you know, make that in, out of nothing into something. So, um, I, I, yeah, the theme I think is wonderful. I think currently, for the most part, other than the projects, what's happening is those themes happen to catch artists who are already working in those themes. Although this year's theme I think was much cleverer in how it was, like Hanali has alluded to already, very open in a, in a way and having sub themes under that theme, I think is, is a, really, a really decent approach. But I think moving forward to, to kind of generate that kind of rigor, if that's what the goal is, which I, it mm -hmm. seems to fall under the remit of the National Gallery, um, I think that there needs to be that, a longer period of time. I know it's tough because you don't know what in mm -hmm. two years is gonna be topical, did we know uh, <laughs> <was coming? laughs> right, yeah, exactly, right? So I know that's, I know that's tough, but there, I think that um, 
the use of the theme is, is very useful, but I think currently, other than those particular projects, I think it, it seems to, it's sort of like I apply to shows that happen to have the theme of my work. <laughs> mm. Yeah. And I think, you know, illustrating this point, um, thinking about, let's talk about the award-winning pieces, and I think the reason I want you to talk about them is because I think in both instances, those artists we're talking about kind of capturing the zeitgeist or the, the sort of uh, the pressing sort of themes of the day. I think those two projects in particular, and I'm referring to um, Caitlin Elphinstone's piece, Artificial Renderings, um, which won the Bendel Hides Award in this year's Biennial. Uh, and also, our emerging artists as well, the, the, the sort of more younger emergent voices in this project. Um, we had a commendation for Rochelle Miller, mm -hmm. whose work is all about cultural mythologies as we were exploring that sub-theme a moment ago. Um, and Alyssa Gilbert as well, her work. So perhaps we could sort of zoom in on those projects. What sort of caught your eye with those? What made those stand out uh, in terms of what we've just been talking about and, and their practice in general? If, you, if you're talking to people or, or trying to engage in a conversation with people about uh, what is in front of them now, and, and particularly if you're guiding them to look at what is in front of them now in relation to where it's come from, then you've, you sort of create a, a structure, you create a framework that almost is directional in that people then begin to how to reflect on, well, what, what does the past mean to me? And what has stayed with me from the past that I consider to be of value? And partic particularly, what, cons what I consider to be of value as an artist, because what, what the artist's um, job is defined as is uh, perpetual challenge, right? The, every time you go to try to make something, you're going to ask yourself the question again, well, what am I doing this for? Hmm. What, what value does this thing have? And if your guide posts are sort of sitting in front of you, it helps to some extent to refer back to them and to have, uh, have the comfort that you're within a, a safe space in your, in your response in a way. In our specific context, the, the sorts of danger of loss that Natalie was speaking of earlier, um, in a cultural sense, it's a, it's a very tricky one in that we have engaged in a process of claiming certain things from the past and putting the, those things through a process of reification, if you will, to say, well, these are the holy things, these are the things that we will hold on to. These are the things that really represent who we are. I am convinced that we're not doing a particularly good job of that. <laughs> that, that that selection process is a fairly narrow one. And what has happened as a result is that we are essentially engaged in what Franz Fanon called the creating the mummified fragments of tradition. Right? So you, you treating these things as if they really represent what you, where you come from and, and therefore what you can become in the future. What, what these artists have done, which makes them uh, interesting or makes the work interesting to, to contemplate is they've said, I'm not sure that that is really where I see things. I'm not sure that that is really an appropriate way to guide people to see things and to say, well, this is your inheritance. So maybe we ought to take another look at this. And the piece that won the Bendel Heights Prize is a 
does that in a, in a very direct, specific way, by literally defacing images and that sort of thing. Images that we are accustomed to seeing in an archival context, and treating those images as if they're part of that sort of holy of holies. And it's an unfortunate context to be in in some ways, but for an artist, I suppose it is like gold because you're, you're sort of, you have a tailor-made challenge. Right? Well, no, I'm not going to accept that because I don't think that that is broad enough, deep enough, etc., etc. And you find ways, therefore, of saying, well, can we find a different uh, way of interrogating the past other than simply taking these specific things that have been presented and taking another look? And uh, Rochelle Miller's piece is one of the more sort of direct examples I've seen of taking uh, pieces of social mythology, if you will, that are very quickly being forgotten and which are not among those things that are being held up as the, uh, as the ones to be reified. And just putting it right in your face, as it mm. were. I mean, there, there's questions to be asked about how one does things and, and whether there are more effective ways to do things and so on. But the fact that it is presented with a certain degree of boldness and the, part of that boldness being just daring to choose that subject in the first place. Mm. I think there are some interesting things going on that are sort of parting the veil a little bit between us who are alive and able to use all our good senses and to figure these things out for ourselves and not be told that the, it is this narrow body of things that is your inheritance. So what you're really saying is it's a kind of recovery of um, the intangible cultural heritage. You know, we talk about um, buildings, the material artifacts of culture. You know, we think about a place like Pedro St. James and Mission House, and obviously, um, interestingly, both of those are, in a sense, fabrications. They've been restored and they've been quite well, authentically restored, but th there is an element of this idea of the commodification of culture and what you're talking about when you think of an artist such as Nasaria and Michael Moffin, who's, who's done a digital animation for this biennial, looking at this idea of both the commodification of culture and other cultural forms that are so easily lost to history. You know? So I think it's an interesting theme for this project that you see in several of the works. Um, but I think we can also perhaps take the opportunity, as we started at the beginning, um, I wanted to circle back big picture to the impact of this project. Mm -hmm. And looking forward, you know, we've talked about the potential for maybe regional expansion. Uh, and I just want to ask kind of each of you in turn and interject, um, thinking about what the impact of a project like this should be, what should we aspire for it to be. Um, we've talked about things like education. Um, you're both gonna be doing portfolio reviews, critiques of artists' work in the coming days. Um, and that's another learning opportunity that we talked about. But I, I was thinking more big picture about this biennial. Um, where is it heading? Where do we think it should evolve to and go to as it grows and expands? And what are some of the takeaways from a project like this that we can, we can use? Well, and we'll maybe, before we jump too far into that future, it's really interesting, I think, to see what impact it's already had. You know, going back to that very early conversation mm. that you had, um, you know, weaving forward to those kind of bigger, um, bigger journey conversations. And just, I was very interested when we were talking about Rochelle's work versus Caitlin a minute ago, it's had a very big impact in the comfort level people have with different media. You know, I think we've, we've tried very hard over the years here to be both museum and experimental institution, which is an unusual series of hats for 
a, a national art museum to be wearing, right? We are an educational institution really because there is not an art college in Cayman. So we are a contemporary experimental space because we don't have another contemporary art center. Um, and I think maybe that is, is, is a lot of the success of the space is that it has this kind of fluid identity in, a, in and of its own right and it's filling, filling gaps. But going back specifically to the sort of impact that it's had to date, if we look at some of the confidence in this exhibition in terms of how people are executing work in this wide spectrum of media. And, and Davin, you said on the podium um, at the award ceremony that there are, there are no placeholders in this mm. exhibition. And I think that's really an interesting moment because, you know, when you're doing these kind of large open calls, you want to give as many artists the opportunity as possible, but you're trying to create these projects that are moving the dial in terms of that level of confidence and that um, showcase of technical skill, of conceptual understanding, um, of, of dialogue that is really responding to theme. There are a series of things that were part of the jury decision-making process. But just looking even at someone like Rochelle versus Caitlin and Caitlin's very sophisticated use of AI that is then balanced out with this very traditional um, approach to weaving back into the work, which is, is this tangible connection to history and yet this incredibly contemporary um, practical application of, of AI technology. And then yet Rochelle's is this incredibly theatrical work. You know, it's about big, bold impact and it's about sort of uh, causing you to jump literally like a duffy word as you open the door into the gallery. It's, it's a very um, difficult piece to curate into a show that doesn't overwhelm everyone else's work, but I think mm. we managed to do that. So before we even talk about the next steps, I'm interested to hear from you guys just about some of those standout pieces that we haven't had a chance to chat about, but maybe rather than standout, some of the really confident projects working in different media, because I think that's what makes this project so exciting is the breadth of um, simple types of artwork, ranging from digital um, uh, sound-based installation work to, to more um, classical paintings to ceramics, the ceramic being one of the foundations, yep. um, you know, for a small piece of ceramic and then this huge theatrical installation that's quite a wide pathway between types of work. So I thought maybe we should explore that a little bit further before mm -hmm. we say what next, because that really is encouraging what the future of the um, arts ecology in Cayman is going to look like, which is exciting. Mm. Yeah, I, I think... Um Having been involved in the National Gallery for like a lot of years, <laughs> I can't remember how long ago. Two thousand and nine, we thank, met. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, but uh, but I was involved before that through in the McCoy Prize yeah, Museum. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I wasn't. I wasn't. Two thousand and two. Yeah. Think. So so um, I've seen sort of like that growth of the of the art scene here, and I and I think a lot of that comes down to the National Gallery having a role in, in basically creating a space for examples. You know, you, you don't know what is possible until you come and see it. And I think like when I, I remember, you know, being interested in art when I was in school and like everything was just watercolors. Mm. I mean, nothing wrong with that, but that's <laughs> like kind of all it was. And somebody was like being experimental if they use oil paint. Um, <laughs> So I, I think that to see that sort of like growth and even when we did, when we talked about doing my solo show, the, even then the conversation was around how do we do this in a way that like when people walk into this space and it's so different than what they're used to, which is, was at that time a lot of sort of a salon hanging. How do we do this to bring people along and go, oh, okay, this is a, so, There's uh, nothing on the wall. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. People would come and go, well, where's the artwork? Because <laughs> there, like, there was only 10 installations. Three, I think we had to do right? like three pieces on a wall, yeah. right? Yeah. But 10 installations in a, in a one large gallery. Yeah, it was yeah. a stunning exhibition. I Thank have you. to say that because we're sharing a panel. <laughs> but it was, again, you know, we approach everything as an educational opportunity. So bringing people right. in and saying, this is what you're seeing. And people would walk out amazed and engaged. So it, you're right. There's been samples of a different approaches to take people and, and, I, and I think that the last few the last couple of biennials before this one have played that like really critical role I think um, 
especially when younger people start to get involved and come in and make work and get in, uh, either get into the show or you know um, apply and then come and see the work I think that helps open their minds to like oh wow there's like all these different things there's there's people doing installation stuff that brings in the community there's people you know doing working with AI and I, yeah I, conceptual work formal work stuff that involves interaction with people like the the drum performance with Randy you know that kind of social practice work so I think that, that I think that is where I see the sort of the, the impact already is that over the years um, and I think before the biennial was sort of envisioned or came to you know fruition before that was a lot of those sort of open call shows that did yeah, this so sort of the same similar, thing yeah. but I think uh, I think the biennial has had like a bigger impact because it it's um the theme seems to be more open than you know right like it's, it's some of the more niche themes that 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 jury shows might have which is sort of curatorial projects yeah with yeah, a yeah, yeah specific right conclusion that we're sort of trying to, yeah. to potentially reach yeah um and i think by its very nature this idea of being out in the community looking for multiple venues looking for venues that really are anti the sort of museum concept, right? And mm. interestingly enough, in year one, we were really encouraging site-specific work. And literally in our conversations with people, have you thought about a site-specific work just to try and get art out literally into the mm. community? So to see three pieces this year is a big success story in, in that, in people's growing confidence and looking, um, because that work is difficult mm. in the climate that we have. Um, so there's been definitely a, there's a sense of maturity, I think, running through um, this biennial that was definitely there before, but just seems to be growing and growing, which I think is, is exciting. Leonard? Yeah, I mean, I think w what it says to me is that there is the potential to continue to do this work of encouraging artists to understand themselves to be independent thinkers, independent, to have a, a possibility of independent response to things. Because it, and that goes back to this, the, the whole commodification thing that, that mm, I am very, so. very, very wary of. That, well, both things, both that commodification and the, the, the sort of reification process that happens in, in an official way, uh, encouraging the artist to be independent and to, and to develop a sense of confidence in their independent perspective on things. That when that they can make something and the judgments they use as to the, the value of the thing that they make are arrived at and on the basis of that growing sense of confidence in their independent judgment. I think that is a, a huge um, potential contribution that is beginning to show up. Yeah. And I think it's important for I guess the, the wider conversations that we're having is to put that again into the context of the commodification because we know that we have a thriving art community with a lot of work that is being very influenced by our tourism audience. You know, we've, our, our art scene developed in that way. The pastels and the watercolors that Davin is referencing, incredibly popular, very collectible, highly skilled, um, and capturing the beauty of this incredible island that we live on. But then evolving through that sort of aesthetic um, uh, focus to these sort of more developed, more conceptual works and taking us through, that's what I mean by the sense of maturity. It's not to suggest that we don't have a very successful commercial side of the art sector, but we're talking about this museum space offering people a platform to be more experimental, and potentially in that, being able to move away from the commercial for a project like this and really bring their best self to that in a way that is very authentic and, and unique. Yeah, well, I mean, one, one of the things I, I hope will happen as a result of the work that, it, that the gallery is doing through the BNL and, and otherwise is to encourage uh, a different kind of approach to, to the past and, and by looking at the past differently, looking at the future prospects differently from the point of view that we don't really understand as as we look at things right now, we don't really understand what 
the artistic vernacular was in the past. Right? We, some of us have had glimpses of it, and know that there were, that there was a, a preoccupation with realistic images, and particularly uh, realistic images that presented themselves as a, a sort of almost like a photo presentation of the object in question. Idyllic. Sorry. An ideal, an ideal. Yeah, idyllic. yeah, and 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 you were you were valued as an artist primarily on the basis that you had the capability of doing that. And in the same way, uh, in the language arts, a preoccupation with the end rhymes and the iambic pentameter. So if you were able to produce um, a piece of language that followed the, the application of those specific rules, then you were doing something that had value. But those little glimpses into what the artistic vernacular was are not re they're not really sufficient. You know? it, what it is that drove that and what, it, what sat alongside it, wh how did it gain its validation in the first place? We, I think we have the challenge of, of having to explore those aspects as well. And the more the the artists are encouraged to think about these kinds of questions. Hopefully, the more of that sort of work will get done, and the more we can mine what that vernacular was, the more we can understand how that vernacular could evolve from here. I think we've been tracing, in a way, an art historical journey, the progression of Cayman in art from, say, the 1960s to the present. And in that, you, you reference kind of using that analogy with literature, the kind of shock of the moment of modernism in literature where you move away from linear storytelling. Um, I think you know, when the Native Sons came on the scene in the 1990s, I think that was a shock for people. Artists, you know, take even before the Native Sons, Bendel High, it's you know, abstract. Exa exa exactly. It's so yeah. foreign, it's so it's yeah. still, yeah. still a shock. Yeah. And it yeah. still is. <laughs> And I think with this biennial, Natalie talked about um, how encouraging it was to see artists really taking that leap, literally, and going and creating site-specific installations. Because I think part of that, there was a, um, a, a gap, in a way, with um, communicating with artists. We talked at the very beginning about what a biennial is, but it's really about this decentralized philosophy. And I just wanted to touch on uh, Latoya Francis and Carrie Ann Chisholm's project and we could talk for a moment about that, being an off-site installation, but also being one that's grounded in the community. Because we've talked about the educational mission of the gallery, and I think one of the aspirations for the National Gallery is to have that engagement with communities in their community. And I think this biennial has really facilitated that. Um, Natalie, would you like to maybe elaborate? I was going to invite Davin to elaborate. <laughs> we haven't heard from him in a couple of breaths, so. I mean, um, I think it's especially important for Cayman because Cayman has always had um, a more, more of a focus on subsistence and we don't have the same kind of um, visual historical culture as other Caribbean islands because we didn't have time for it. There was no sort of time for leisure in that way. Um, and I think that sets Cayman apart as a Caribbean island. I think it, it, it influences the artwork, I know it influences mine. That kind of um, spareness or sparseness or terseness that you might mistake for minimalism is, I think, comes directly from, um, from this sort of place and this, this, this culture. That also means, though, that there was a lot of people that didn't have any value for art. Yeah, no, why are you wasting your time doing this? Um, you know, maybe if you can make someone and sell the tourists, then I could see the point of it. And I, so I think that those things that are, that are site specific and engage the community are critical to the growth of the art scene in Cayman and the appreciation of art because it, it shows community members right in their space what the value of art is, how art can reach us, you know. Um, one of my favorite things I heard recently was, I think it was Ethan Hawke, 
talking about creativity and he was mm. like no one cares about creativity until um something major happens in your life someone dies you break up you know you get you're about to get married you have a child and then all of a sudden you want to know that you are not like alone that somebody else has felt that way and whether that's a poem or a painting or a thing you, but that can't happen if we don't have that taken back to the community to have them engage with it and see that value and to go oh actually yeah all the things that were important to me in my life i tried to memorialize those things in some way that wasn't practical <laughs> so i think that, that, that to me that's what i where i see um I mean, I'm by nature an object maker. I have a greater appreciation for the making of objects just because I can understand how it works. But I think that those kinds of artworks, those social engaging artworks in community, artworks in site specific are critical. I agree, but I, I, I disagree to some extent about the, the lack of value of art in that I think it, the value that was placed Although I, I agree with the, the sort of fixation on the practical because it's a very pragmatic culture historically. Mm -hmm. But the value uh, placed on art had more to do with things like the excellence in carpentry, for argument's sake. Mm -hmm. the, the person who could turn out the, the most excellent uh, fitting of cabinetry and that sort of thing had a, a, had a standing in the community not labeled as art, but now we might look at it and say, well, that goes beyond craft to fine art or has the potential to, if it was applied in different ways or whatever. So, but it's part of, part of the, the, the question that I have about our lack of understanding of what the artistic vernacular was. What was the scope of it? How, how did it manifest itself in the culture that we have now put behind us. Right? And part, part of our um, cultural amnesia mm -hmm. has to do with that, the absence of uh, an answer to those kinds of questions. Yeah. And I suppose thinking about amnesia, we, we talked about the sub theme, uh, sites of memory, but uh, Natalie, maybe you could say something to, um, you know, what the role of say the National Gallery is within the command and cultural landscape. And I'm thinking about actually more old fashioned models of what a museum is, you know, a, a repository of cultural artifacts, a, a keeper of objects. But now it's 2023. So what have museums evolved into and specifically the National Gallery with a project such as this biennial as we look ahead? You know, what, what, where does the National Gallery sit and what is its role, thinking bigger picture as Leonard has alluded to about its place within society? Yeah, and, and just to, to comment on a, one point of Leonard's before I do, I do that, um, the value that we're putting into research and development I think is, has been critically missed. Um, we've talked about this a lot, both from the writing standpoint, from the more traditional academic research, getting access to that research is incredibly difficult. And even when you were referring to Caitlin's images and this sort of iconography of a certain set group of images that we see everywhere because they're the only archival images that might be publicly accessible. Mm. So there are so many limitations that we're not really even considering when we are trying to find out um, whether these mythologies are real or whether they're you know, finite parts of our history. We have one book that has mistakes in it that we all know now and found upon the seas. One of our biggest artists is there and he's, his name is spelt wrong. So does that name become who he is known as going forward? <laughs> so we don't take the time to sort of unpack or question whether what we are receiving, either in the school sector, because we've got one archival document that becomes the teaching method, um, we're not necessarily questioning where those sources are coming from and how authentic they are. Um, and I, my hope, I think, as, as you were talking, Leonard, I was just thinking that, you know, a project like this, I'm hoping inspires the artists that have engaged with this theme to continue doing research-based research practice in their work. We know that there's a, you know, commerce has to 
drive um, front and centre for a lot of artists working full time. That's critical. Um, but I think we could really move forward more rapidly if this engagement with research, archiving, um, sourcing primary materials uh, to influence our practice, whether we're writers or curators or artists, could help fill a lot of the gaps that we have in the way that we are recording this history. Um, and that's something that the NCF are trying to do with the Artist Residency Program and Nasara Suku Shalat right now is doing her Duffy Stories Residency based on this re research um, um, based practice, practice approach. But I think in the gallery, I mean, that's a huge, interesting question. And I, you know, I've been director here for many years at this point, and I'm very honored and, and grateful to be in this role with the team that we have. It's an amazingly inspiring group of people to work with. And I think one of the things we do well is constantly question ourselves and what this role is. Mm. So rather than getting comfortable, um, you know, and I, I've been told off sometimes by my team as director for not coming up with the next big idea because we have, you know, we work, we have a fast paced environment here and the biennial was one of those things, right? Is it, it's an enormous undertaking, but it can be a game changer. And I, I like the fact that this institution, um, and maybe it's because this is the focus that we're bringing to it under the current watch with the current team, is a very responsive institution. I think we, as a group, whether you know, we, we, we develop these exhibition projects with the education team, with the curatorial team, and the rest of the administration, because everyone plays a role, certainly, uh, with a project as, as wide in scope as the biennial is. So it's being informed by multiple viewpoints in terms of a museum scape. And I think a lot of the larger, uh, more historic institutions internationally don't necessarily have that flexibility because they have their departments here and that department then comes up with a concept that moves to the exhibition design team, that moves to the lighting design team, then to the art handlers. And because we're a small team, we have to do all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, it can be exhausting, but it can also allow us to be very nimble. And I know that word is completely outdated now, but it, it actually describes us quite well. So I would like this institution to always be responsive and nimble and having an education um, core, because we started as a small education um, project in the back of the founding director's car. So we were, I call us a back to front museum and I use that term a lot when I'm presenting internationally. We started as an education project first and became a collecting based institution not the other way around, which is really unusual, mm. specifically when you're looking at things like art museums, right? Um, so I think that's allowed us to be very different in our approach, but we're also about, there was a lot of gaps in our arts ecology. You know, we're a small country, we have a very high net worth that's starting to trickle down into supporting more formal full-time art careers, and we have full-time artists in the audience here, which is really exciting to see. Um, but even 10 years ago, that wasn't very practical. Um, so I think filling the, the gaps as we see them until other organizations, institutions, art collectives come through the ranks as they have been doing in things like um, everything from Art Nest to Three Girls in a Kiln in terms of sort of gathering and just having fun with a creative process um, to really exciting you know, commercial galleries that are very contemporary in their nature. Um, you know, more and more is, is evolving and, and, and coming down the line, which I think creates for an incredibly exciting environment. And I hope that we can continue to think about these catalyst type projects that really spark all of those things, um, rather than just becoming this sort of classic institution that, with a collecting base mission. Yeah. So final thoughts from mm -hmm. Leonard and Daphne as we wrap up. We'll be back to that biennial. Yeah. What can the biennial be? Yeah. Um, where can it go? Hmm. One of the growths that I hope will occur sooner rather than later, and this is not the sort of um, broader brush things that we've been discussing, but more grounded, practical things. I think there's a, there's a real need to look at the cost of working as an artist and the sort of support systems that artists need in order to be able to function as artists, to be able to make the choice to make something. Because 
materials are expensive. Studio space is either not available or would be very difficult to come by. Mm -hmm. uh, having associations with other artists in other jurisdictions that can give you some sense of context, some, sen some, some sense of where you fit in the wider picture and stimulate work, uh, stimulate you to work in different ways, to, to try different things. I think those kinds of areas need to be explored fairly quickly because I, I, mean, I, I know a guy in, from East End who doesn't show work hardly, does anything anymore because, and I've seen stuff that he did even in high school that just blew me away. Right? But this cost of material is just killing him. Right? He, he works as a, as a security guard. I mean, he's, he's not going to be able to pull in the kind of dollars to, to afford the material, so stuff needs to be done. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a good point. I think um, where I was sort of thinking about the biennial's future, um, I, I think that the, the, the path that the, the team here has chosen, I think is really a wise one and smart to have it start as a biennial to generate this um, energy. So it's coming around very, very often. I think uh, Came on Art Week has helped that too. Um, and the, and the, the fact that they overlap, I think helps tremendously to like generate this, this sort of um, public interest. I think moving forward, to raise, to continue to raise the level of artwork, I would probably think about a triennial, just to give yeah. artists a longer. We are. <laughs> really? And Already? We are. We okay. Are. okay. For, for us as well. Okay. Right? Okay. It, yeah. is, it is. It is an exhausting undertaking for Th everybody. That involved. was where I was. Yeah. And you don't just want people to be rushing to mm. submit. Well, not just the yeah. the artists, but I saw a little bit of behind the scenes as a juror of the how what it takes for the team to to do all this and you know, it's um to pull all that together in such a short period of time is I can't even uh yeah, that's there's no way. Mm -hmm. Um but it's, it it's done and it's amazing. I think a triennial though would would help eventually once that energy is there art and people know it's coming around, give artists a chance to look ahead and go, I'm going to make the best thing that, that I can. And I think then that moves this from um, having any danger of being just a sort of um, cross-sectional survey of where art is now, because I don't think that that's what it is. It is. This is supposed to be, that's more what came on Art Week is. This is like the best of the best that, and, uh, so yeah, to me, that's where I would see it moving. For everybody's sake. <laughs> uh, it's funny you should say that. We have talked about it. Really? Um, okay. I, I didn't want to overstep. <laughs> no, but I think as well, I think for me, again, and Will, you alluded to this earlier on, we were talking about the catalogue. And of course, speaking of resources, we don't have resources at the National Gallery, very unfortunately, to be creating catalogues for every single major exhibition. Not just financial resources to print a catalogue, which were extraordinary in Cayman, but also just the resources of time, mm -hmm. academic research and writing that warrants a, a, a properly developed publication, mm -hmm. um, which we'd love to do more of. Um, but I think the, the importance beyond the, the exhibition experience, the exhibition moment, this four month chance to interact with the works directly, which can't be beaten, I would recommend everybody come and see this as often as they can and go to Miss Lassie's house and try and get to the sister islands and the site specific works, all of which can be found on the website. But how do we then document this and share it with the world? Because mm. the second part of what we're trying to do here at the institution and as the, curator, the curatorial team um, is then take the evidence of these works and the information about all of the artists involved and share that with major institutions and curators internationally. So there's this always a second part of when the project comes down, the virtual experience is on the website and it's actually up already um, so that you can watch, watch this simultaneously, either come here or go online and do your walkthroughs. And that will continue to evolve as we bring on the other sites, so it's just this major space that is on there right now, but we want to be able to share this beyond this, this sort of moment of four months and I think publication, the on-site digitization of um, both the, the walked experience, but the works themselves, the artists involved, and then how we can 
have impact through a project like this that is a lot bigger than the project itself. Mm. I think is definitely something that is a critical component of the biennial now and the biennial or triennial going <laughs> forward um, for us. And we're already seeing you know, the tangible effects of this. We have four Caymanian artists who are represented in uh, a very prestigious publication that was published recently, the A to Z of Caribbean Art, down in Ebanks. One you of them. have to give a disclaimer there, <laughs> and I wrote your text. <laughs> <laughs> We've had um, a lot of our, our younger and emerging artists going away, um, receiving scholarships, studying at art colleges overseas, mm -hmm. and coming back, and to see the growth in their own practices, I think has been very, very rewarding. And these are tangible markers of success. And I think a lot of that traces back to a project such as this and, okay. and the and work of our cultural organizations. In yeah, the institutions. And I think sometimes people wonder what the institutions, you can't see everything that happens. I think it's a really good point to say a lot of those careers have formulated here through not just an experience of walking through someone else's exhibition and seeing other work and being inspired, but through our scholarship program and our mm -hmm. intern program and the follow-up with a lot of those artists overseas with grants and um, networking and introduction opportunities. So there's a lot of that type of work that we're very committed to doing and I think that has had an impact more directly with some individuals, right, rather than with the bigger ecology that we've been talking about today, um, which is, which is uh, a critical part of the work. Well, I think we can wrap it up there. I just wanted to say thank you for our audience for being here with us and to our panelists, Natalie Urquhart, Leonard Dilbert and Davin Ebanks and uh, invite people to come and see the exhibition. If you haven't already, come and see it or see it again. Um, the third Cayman Islands Biennial is up until the 29th of September this year. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.